Hey, what's going on? My name is Brandon Moore from More D&D, and today I'm going through everything involved in building this table, from dimensions, to materials, to the reasons I did things the way I did. So come on. I need to clear this thing off first. Whew. All right, so now that I've got everything cleared off, I'm gonna go briefly over the actual dimensions of the table itself. The outside is six feet by six feet, giving each player essentially three feet of space. The inside map portion is four feet by four feet. So a 48 inch grid by 48 inch grid still isn't enough for anyone with- You're like 600 feet away. Just make it 20 foot squares. The table itself is about 32 inches tall and it has about 26 inches of leg room. So if we look at the table from the side here and we start from the bottom up, we can start with these big beefy pine legs. These are just four by fours right from Home Depot, which I planed down to be about three and a quarter inches thick. The table used about three or four of them. Then the next thing up here is the bottom of the shelf. That is a three quarter inch sheet of birch plywood. Gives it that nice smooth finish. It's a nice looking plywood. It's a bit more expensive at the store, but I went for the look on this one. The top here is a three layered tabletop. And there's a reason I did that. The first layer is a three quarter inch sheet of sanded plywood. That's mostly for structure and rigidity. Give it that heft. The next layer up is a half inch sheet of plywood. And the reason I did that is because I knew I was gonna be adding these dice trays and that helped raise the dice tray up a little bit so it was a, a bit thicker and it would hold the dice in. Then on top of this plywood, I put the fabric that was going underneath of the mat portion. Then I covered it up with this whiteboard material. So that is what gives it the eighth inch thick material that the plexiglass matches on the inside. So I figure since I was already down here, I might as well crawl under the table here and give you a good look at what it looks like underneath. And we're gonna start right here where all the magic happens at this junction box. Now I am gonna note, I am not a licensed electrician, so I will not be giving you electrical advice here. If this is something you're interested in, the first thing I'm gonna recommend is hiring a licensed electrician to do the work for you. If you're not gonna go that route, then definitely check out the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of videos out there from electricians teaching you how to do this the right way. Yeah, yeah, whatever. So back to the junction box. I have this hardwired to a regular cable, the other end of which is just a plug that goes right into the wall, and that supplies power to the entire table. Then I have this hardwired over to a switch near my side of the table there, and that switch links right up to this outlet here, which controls the light. So if I turn the switch on, the lights come on. If I turn the switch off, the lights go off. And the reason I did it that way is because I have constant power hardwired into all the outlets. So that way, even if I turn the lights on and off, people can still charge their devices using the outlets that are spread around the table. So I have one switch controlling the lights, and I have no switch controlling the outlets. If I want these unplugged, I have to physically unplug the table. As far as the structure underneath goes, starting with the legs, you can see I have nine of them. Nine! So I have one supporting the center of the table, then I have the one on each corner, and I have one in the middle of each side. So it's a nice even spacing for two players on each side, split up by the center leg. So as far as framing goes, you can see I have two two by fours here running the whole length of the table, splitting this leg. This supports the center of the table and pretty much the whole table. But additionally, I have some regular 16 inches on center framing just to cover my basis here. I also have 11 inch shelving all the way around. I didn't go any deeper than that because I knew these outlets were gonna take a little bit of room on the inside. So I wanted to make sure I had plenty of space for that. And then everything is held together by either wood glue or screws in a pocket hole jig. And while I'm down here, I'll talk about the shelving itself. It's 10 and a quarters inch deep which is perfect for any notebooks and such that if you put them horizontally here, they fit right in. It's four inches tall, which gives you a bunch of room to stack things, and it's three feet wide. So plenty of space for anyone that wants to store their notebooks, all their minis, dice, or anything you wanna hide from the DM. You're hiding something. You can fit it all under here. I have an outlet at each seat, as I mentioned before, and then you can see I have the LEDs running around the table. I have them stuck at the top, so that way anyone that's sitting at the table or standing, you see the glow of the color underneath without seeing that bright, harsh LED light coming out. Here, looking at the dice trays now, you can probably see the two layers I mentioned on top of that three quarters of an inch layer. This is the plywood topped with the whiteboard material. Underneath, you can see I have a green felt. This is actually one big sheet of felt that I glued to that first layer, and then I have a different color in each corner. The next two layers, I actually cut this triangular shape out first before gluing it down onto the table. 
I used a router following a template all the way around and then just flip the template over for this side. So it gives you two of the same size triangles and it gives you a little bit of spacing in between the two players. This is an eight inch triangle, which gives it two inches of space here and two inches of space here because this is a 12 inch wide sheet of whiteboard material. As I mentioned with the map area, it's covered with two sheets of plexiglass, eighth inch thick. I made these little indents in the whiteboard material to make it easy to reach underneath and pick up. When I'm changing out a map, I'll have someone grab the other side. We would lift, slide both off, put the map down and then slide both on and we'd be good to go. The fabric underneath is just a cotton fabric print that you can get right from Michaels. I covered it all the way around and glued it down onto that half inch sheet of plywood, the second layer. If you know anything about construction material, you know that most sheet goods come in four feet by eight feet. And if you start extrapolating the math out a little bit and you think, hey, well, this is a six foot by six foot table that doesn't fit perfectly. Wait a minute. You're right, it doesn't. I knew it, I knew it. So I had to rip these down to three feet wide so that way they would meet in the center perfectly. So each layer actually has a line going through it all the way across. This first one I had going this way, the next one I alternated going the opposite direction, and then the third one down I went back this way. And I did that for two reasons. The first one is that if I would have lined them up the same, they could eventually over time collectively start to split apart and you get a gap there. By alternating it and gluing it that way, it makes it impossible for it to split. Additionally, if I were to put all the lines on the same side, where they meet up, there's a little bit of a build up there. So all three layers building up at the same spot would have made a little bit of a bump, which I really wanted to avoid. So I just alternated everything. On the DM side of the table, I typically have two monitors here, my TV case and my laptop, all of which needs to be plugged in without the cables getting in my way. So I drilled this hole in the top of the table. 3D printed that little cover for it, so that way all the cables can be run into the table and plugged into the outlet without getting in the way. Additionally, I drilled a second hole in the shelf itself, so that way cords like my HDMI cable can run straight through the shelf down under the table and over to my laptop without getting in the way of the things that I might be storing inside the shelf or popping out and looking kind of ugly. And just a couple finishing touches that I didn't go over yet. I did change the light color here so that hopefully you can see it a little bit better. I put a chamfered corner all along the edge of the shelving here. That's so nobody hurts their hands when they're sliding things in and out. And I also think it gives it a little bit more of a finished look. This was as simple as using a hand router with a chamfer bit and going all along the edge before I ever put the shelf in. And then as far as the dark tabletop goes, this was as simple as buying a black stain right from Home Depot and using a foam brush to dab it all along the edge that edge grain really soaks it in. And the reason I did this was to kind of hide the imperfections of the plywood. And I think it turned out great. Okay, before I end this video, I'd like to go over a parts list of all the things I used in this table build. That way you can get an idea of what it might cost you to do the same thing because prices today are way different than they were back then. So I used four to five four by fours right from Home Depot. I used one four by eight sheet of three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood for the shelving. It's the nicer but more expensive plywood, but in my opinion, it's worth it. I used two four by eight, three quarter inch sheets of sanded plywood for the first layer of the tabletop. I used two four by eight sheets of half inch sanded plywood for the second layer. And then I used two four by eight sheets of whiteboard material. That makes up the whole tabletop. And then of course you have the two two by four sheets of plexiglass, which I got off Amazon and I'll link that down below. Then of course there's the two by fours that you need for the framing, which I believe I use three eight footers. You may not need three, but it's always good to have extras just in case. And then I bought all the fabrics from Michael, including the printed fabric that I have underneath the plexiglass here and the velvety fabric that I have underneath the dice trays. Then you just need a million screws, a bunch of wood glue and a couple brad nails here and there to hold everything together. And you'll have yourself an epic game table. But of course, if you wanna add the fancy stuff like the outlets and the lights, you're gonna to have to buy those too. In my case, I added nine outlets total, including the one underneath and the switch. So that's 10 junction boxes, nine outlets, and a switch with all their corresponding face plates, as well as another steel junction box, which I have all of that hardwired to. Then I bought an extension cord, which is what I cut one end of to hardwire into the junction box and use the other end to plug into the wall. And then of course the LED lights, which really you can buy any RGB LED lights that you can find on Amazon. They'll all work. They just have to be able to stick to something. And then if you want them to be colorful, they gotta be able to change colors. So everything you need for this table is actually already uploaded to my Patreon, which I'll link down below. So if you wanna head over there and become a patron, you'll be able to download the SketchUp file that I designed when I made this table. And that gives you all the dimensions you need to get started today. 
So go ahead over and check it out. If you want to see more of my D&D setup, check out my last video where I go over everything in what I call my dungeon, including my miniatures cabinet, some aesthetics like my swords, the custom chandelier, and even a behind the scenes look at what I have behind the DM screen. Thank you so much for stopping by and I can't wait to see you in the next video where we're going to discuss everything 3D printing miniatures with an FDM printer. See you then.